Hello, I'm Mark Payne of the West Virginia Humanities Council. Welcome to History Alive. History Alive is a program of the Humanities Council that brings historical figures to life through portrayals by presenters who have conducted thorough research into their character. These presentations are both entertaining and educational. The Humanities Council makes these characters available to nonprofit organizations across West Virginia, such as schools, libraries, historical societies, and a wide range of community groups. Their presentation fee is paid by the Council, and we ask only that their travel costs be covered by the host group. History Live is designed as an interactive experience between the character and the audience. We encourage your organization or school to host a presentation and bring a figure from history for a visit with your audience or students. Having someone like Harriet Tubman or Stonewall Jackson come to speak to your group can breathe life into these historical figures. Nothing compares to the live in-person visit. Each presentation consists of three parts, a monologue, a question answer session with the character, and then the presenter breaks character to answer questions about how he or she conducted their research. Our History Lab presenters have re researched a variety of sources such as diaries, journals, letters, official documents, autobiographies, and the research of other scholars in developing their character. A History Lab presentation is not a play. It is an audience participation event that relies on interaction between the audience and the character. Being able to ask your own questions of these important figures from the past is a unique experience. It's difficult to reproduce the feel of an actual History Lab presentation here in the studio. Without an audience to ask questions, we'll change the format a bit and have our guests sit with me for a few questions after the monologue. But we hope to give a sample of how a History Lab presentation can add to the offerings at your school or organization. There will be information on the screen at the end of the program for how to contact the Humanities Council about bringing a History Lab character to your community. At this time, I would like to welcome today's guest from history. We are pleased to have with us in the studio Edgar Allan Poe. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Thus ends The Raven, a poem I wrote in 1845. And while I was only paid $9 for writing The Raven, it did afford me a certain amount of international fame. Children would follow me in the streets and call me the raven, and I would pretend to be a bird and flap my wings and say, nevermore. But I am far more than the raven, and I welcome this opportunity to talk with you, tell you the truth about my life, some of my works, and later to answer some questions. Both my parents were traveling actors, but before I continue, I must emphasize that while I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, I was raised in Richmond, and I consider myself a Southern gentleman and am proud to be a Virginian. Though most of my adult life was spent in the Northern states, specifically Philadelphia, Maryland, and New York. But getting back to my childhood, my parents were traveling actors and I was born in Boston uh, when they were appearing at the Boston Federalist Theater. It is said that my father was far less talented than my mother, and after a series of very bad, very bad reviews on his part, bouts with alcoholism and financial problems, my father deserted the family, leaving my mother alone to raise her family the only way she knew how, through acting. She took the family to Richmond when I was two years old and she was 24. But there, she started spitting up blood, the first sign of consumption, a disease that always ended in death. My mother just became weaker and weaker until one night, surrounded by her three children, she closed her eyes for the last time. Perhaps this is why so many of my stories deal with young women who die prematurely. Now, before my mother passed away, a lady from the community by the name of Frances Allen 
talked with my mother and agreed to raise me with her husband John Allen. But John Allen did not want to formally adopt me, and he never did. I don't think he wanted his precious Virginia bloodline tainted by the blood of an actress's son. But I will admit that John Allen was able to provide very well for me financially. In the summers, like most of the wealthier families in uh, Richmond and for the, in the South for that matter, we went to White Sulphur Springs in Western Virginia. There I had a pony and several dogs, and the happiest times of my life were spent in the beautiful Greenbrier Valley. Now, John Allen's uncle, William Galt, was the wealthiest man in Virginia. And when he died, when I was a youth, he left his entire estate to John Allen. John Allen was now a very wealthy man. He wanted me to be a businessman like him, but I knew from an early age that I wanted to be a writer. And I also knew that I was somehow different from other people. I wrote about these feelings later in my poem, Alone. From childhood's hour, I have not been as others were. I have not seen as others saw. I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source, I have not taken my sorrow. And all I loved, I loved alone. Then in my childhood, in the dawn of a most stormy hour, was drawn from every depth of good and ill, the mystery that binds me still. From the torrent of the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold. From the lightning in the sky, as it passed me, flying by. From the thunder and the storm, and the cloud that took the form while the rest of heaven was blue, of a demon in my view. Now, John Allen used his considerable influence to enable me to attend the University of Virginia, then in its second year of operation. Thomas Jefferson was the president and lived nearby. And John Allen only gave me $110 to last the entire year. Why, tuition alone was over $300. Well, I started gambling and accumulated debts of over $2,000. John Allen refused to help me, and I had to leave school. I later went to West Point, but left after a few months for very much the same reason. John Allen would not support me financially. I returned home only to find that Francis Allen, the kind foster mother who meant everything to me had died. No one bothered to tell me. And now there was no one to protect me from John Allen. He hated me, threw me out of the house, and said that if I tried to come back, he would have me arrested. I then went to live with my Aunt Mariah Clem in Baltimore. And there I met her daughter, Virginia. I married her when she was 13 and I was 26. We had a very happy marriage. My Virginia meant everything to me. I tried to support her through writing alone, but we were always poor because it seemed that the writings that people did want were ones that I was not paid very much for. I tried writing poetry and prose and mostly literary criticism. There were two gentlemen whose opinions I greatly respected, Philip Pendleton Cook and Dr. Joseph Evan Snodgrass, both from Berkeley County in Western Virginia. But the majority of individuals were people that I did not like. I thought their writings were mediocre at best. The best example of that was Dr. Thomas Dunn English, a man who, after I had given him a very honest but scathing review, said some terrible things about me in print. And I took these scandalous matters, this information that was very specific, and sued him for libel, and I won. And I was able to buy some new furniture. I also wrote a revenge story, The Cask of Amontillado. But nothing specific, well, I could be sued for libel. But I made myself into the character of Montresor and Dr. English into the character of Fortunado. And Montresor takes Fortunato to the catacombs underneath an unspecified European city, gets him drunk, chains him to a wall, and proceeds to bury him alive. So if anyone reads that story in the future, 
It will be as though Thomas Dunn English is being buried alive over and over and over again. It was now midnight and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished the last and the eleventh. There remained but one stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice that I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunado. It said, <laughs> A very good jest indeed. We will have many a rich laugh about this over our wine. Yes, the Amontillado wine. <laughs> Yes, the Amontillado, but is it not getting late? Will not they be missing us, the Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, let us be gone. <laughs> for the love of God, Montresor. Yes, for the love of God. But to these words I hearkened in vain for a reply. I placed my torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth only in return the jingling of the bells on his cap. My heart grew sick. It was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. I placed in position the final stone and plastered it in. And then erected a rampart of bones around the grave. For the past fifty years, no human being has disturbed them. May he rest in peace. In 1842, I was singing one night at home with Virginia, and she was playing the piano when she started spitting up blood. And I knew that, like my mother, she had developed consumption. I cared for her for the next six years until her death. I later wrote, six years ago, a wife who I loved as no man has ever loved before ruptured a blood vessel in singing. Her life was despaired of. She recovered partially, and I again hoped. Then, at the end of a year, the blood vessel broke again and again, and even more once again. And each time I loved her more dearly and clung to her more desperately. But I am constitutionally sensitive, nervous to an unusual degree. I became insane with long intervals of horrible sanity. But I feel that I will be happy because I returned to Richmond and saw Sarah Elmira, Sarah Elmira Royster on the front row. You see, Sarah and I had been engaged when I was a youth before I went to the University of Virginia. But when her father found that I was not heir to the Allen fortune, he intercepted the letters that I sent her and intercepted the letters that she sent me. So we thought the other had lost interest. When we met each other again, I found that her husband had passed away and she was now a very wealthy widow. We rekindled our romance, and I will be marrying her next month. And I wrote a poem, Annabelle Lee, that will be published in the Richmond Times Dispatch with the announcement of our wedding. Some people might consider it a bit morbid, but I feel that it deals with a love that lasts throughout eternity. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived that you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. And we loved with a love that was more than love. I and my Annabel Lee with a love that the wicked seraphs in heaven coveted her and me. 
the angels not half so happy in heaven with envying her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so all the night tide I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride. And the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee in her sepulcher there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. In my works, I have written about beauty and love, such as in Annabelle Lee, and about the darker side of man, such as my tales of terror. I would like to end the first portion of our time together with a section of the 1843 version of the Telltale Heart about a narrator who may or may not be sane. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous. I had been and am, but why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I could hear all things in the heaven and the earth. I could hear many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. Why, I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. The story continues with the narrator murdering the old man and burying his body beneath the flooring. The police arrive. He feels that everything is fine until he starts to hear, or imagine this, he is hearing, the beating of the old man's heart. I gasp for breath. And yet the officers heard it not. I talked more freely. But the noise continued. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as the watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I, 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 I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides as if excited to fury by the observation of the men. But the noise continued. And what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore, I swung the chair upon which I had sat and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still they chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no. They heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought and this I think. But anything was more tolerable than this derision. Anything was better than this agony. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more, I admit the deed. Tear up the planks, here, here, it is the beating of his hideous heart. We're here with author Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, Mr. Poe, I want to thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule and being with us here today. Uh, you mentioned in your talk a few moments ago uh, several things I'd like to ask you a little more about. Um, if you could uh, share with us a little bit about your early, uh, your early days and your childhood, uh, shed a little light on that for us, would you? Well, I was born into a very poor family uh, with my birth mother, and then she passed away, and as you may know, I went to live with the Allens, and that is where I got the name Edgar Allan Poe. Originally, I was Edgar Poe. That was my birth name. Uh, but uh, even though the Allens did provide a great deal of financial support for me, I never felt truly wanted with them. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Allen wanted me to be a businessman like him. Uh, and uh, But, they, well, they, uh, Francis Allen was extremely kind. Mm -hmm. Did you have brothers and sisters? No, I did not. Okay, so you were an only child. Right, I was the only child in the family. And the Allens, they, they, while they were kind enough to take you in, they, you, they did not adopt you legally. No, they right? never did. Never. Okay, uh, I know you, you, you wrote 
uh, you've been writing for several years and um, tell us a little bit about some of your early work uh, I think you've written things like uh, you've done some travel writing and and, uh, and worked as a critic uh, I know you've written detective stories and, and horror stories and poetry uh, tell us a little bit about some of your early things that you've done well, I first started writing poetry uh, and then uh, prose stories that you know that that people seem to really like. Uh, but uh, the majority of the work I did were, were travel stories and especially lit literary criticism. Uh, I wrote, for example, a story about Harper's Ferry in Western Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, the said the view from Harper's Ferry is perhaps the most picturesque in the United States. The view amply compensates the viewer for his trouble. And then, of course, literary criticism. Uh, I wrote hundreds of pages of, to be completely honest, very bad books as subjects. In other mm -hmm. words, the books that I reviewed at that time in the United States were, for the most part, very bad. Uh, and I, um, I was known as the Tomahawk Man because of my uncompromising principles. Hmm. Well, I guess as a critic, you'd, you would need to, to maintain those uh, principles, wouldn't you? Yes, I did not believe that a person should get a good review just because they were an American. Hmm. So who, were, who, who have been some of your, uh, your influences uh, as far as writers? Well, definitely uh, Mr. William Shakespeare. There are hundreds of references to Mr. Shakespeare in my work. And then of the writers currently living, I would have to say Mr. Charles Dickens. Yes, uh, in fact, we actually met in Philadelphia to discuss our mutual interest in copyright laws. Hmm. Was there anything in particular that, about uh, Mr. Dickens' work that appeals to you? Well, I like the way that he, ri he wrote, uh, his uh, tremendous command of the English language and especially the characters that he used. Uh, but um, we, uh, we met and he was at that time working on a novel called Barnaby Rudge. And one of the characters was a grip, a raven, a talking raven, a rather playful raven. Well, he mentioned that his pet had died and I assumed that it was a cat, a dog. And then he told me that the pet's name was Grip and I realized that the pet was a raven. Hmm. Now, I had been working on a poem about a talking owl, and I realized it would be much better to make that a talking raven. <laughs> so, uh, uh, was uh, uh, his, his pet then, was, was that the inspiration for your poem, The Raven? Yes, it was. It definitely was. And uh, I believe you said earlier that that work didn't really earn you a lot of, of uh, financial uh, gain, but uh, could, was that seen as a big sort of a, a break for you or, or gain you much in the way of recognition? Well, I had a real desire to write. I wrote that with me, poetry is not just a passion, but a purpose. And uh, the, uh, the Raven, although I was only paid nine dollars for it, uh, did make my name more well known, even around the world. It took several years, but uh, uh, it did that. Mm. Uh, what would you say is your favorite genre of writing uh, b between all the different types that you do? I would definitely say poetry. Really? Uh, definitely poetry. poetry, is poetry what yes. you, uh, well, you're certainly very good at it. Well, thank you. Thank uh, you. Um, and, and at this point, I'd like to uh, say that this isn't really Edgar Allan Poe with us today. This is actually George Bartley of Morgantown. George is one of our new uh, History Live uh, characters on, on our roster. I want to welcome you, George, to the show and welcome you to the roster as well. I know you've been out and about to traveling the state doing a lot of presentations for the History Live program. And I'm going to ask you what I ask everybody on this show, which is first, what was it about uh, this, this character, Edgar Allan Poe, that uh, moved you to want to do the research and, and, and give portrayals of him? Well, I majored in Shakespeare uh, in uh, grad school, and Poe is America's Shakespeare. He has that same kind of command of the, of, uh, the English language, uh, and I worked at the Edgar Allan Poe Museum in Richmond. It's just a short jump from being a uh, Shakespeare nerd to a Poe nerd. Yeah. And, <laughs> uh, and the, um, so did you work at the museum because you're interested in Poe, or did you become interested in Poe because you worked at the museum? Probably both, probably oh. both. And I learned more, of course, as a guide, you know, I learned more and more about Poe. Mm -hmm. But I thought when I moved to uh, Morgantown uh, that my days of you know, being interested in Poe were pretty much over. I was not going to be in the Poe community anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I found out the connections of Poe to West Virginia and, you know, was fascinated. Right. Well, I know you mentioned in your monologue that he, I guess he spent some time in White Sulphur Springs. Right, geographically, and yes. And I guess he visited Harper's Ferry. Right, yes. And, um, uh, of course, his sort of battle there with uh, Mr. Uh, English uh, 
Yes, Dr. Dr. English, who uh, uh, after Poe died, moved to Western Virginia and became the first mayor of uh, Lawnsville, Virginia, which is now Logan, right. West Virginia. Right. So there's not, there are not many, I'm guessing there's not many mayors uh, of uh, towns in West Virginia who can say that they were sued by a girl <laughs> <laughs> or buried alive. Right. That's, 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 exactly. He was the, I guess he was the inspiration for that story, which uh, is, uh, is a little different. But so how did you go about organizing your research uh, to build your character uh, of Poe? Well, it started uh, with the uh, uh, Humanities Council History of, or Encyclopedia of West Virginia History, mm -hmm. and that's where I saw the mention of um, Thomas Stone English. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I just started looking at other books, and th bo uh, books from the library uh, at uh, the Poe Museum, the Carnegie, and then of course the incredible uh, University, uh, West Virginia University Library, mm -hmm. and uh, the Appalachian Center. Right. Um, the uh, yeah. Uh, a lot of Poe's stories are sort of standard uh, reading, standard curriculum in, in schools, continue to be. Yes. Um, and uh, I'm just curious, what is it, why do you think that is, what is it that uh, stands the test of time in Poe's writing? Well, people like to be scared. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, uh, well, and students love horror movies, mm -hmm. for, for example, but I mean with Poe you've got horror but with substance. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, really great again, a real great use of the English language. Um, he, he wrote he wrote horror stories or tales of or, you know, terror stories and stuff. Uh, do you think he wrote those because he enjoyed writing them, or was that where the money was? Uh, definitely, that was because that's where the money was. Really? Uh, even then, that was yeah. Money. Even then, I mean, there. For example, I'll just give you one quick example. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, uh, he worked for the Southern Literary Messenger in Richmond, uh, and uh, he wrote a story called Berenice about a man who was in love with his wife's teeth. She was dying, and the, the teeth were the only part that were healthy. So, uh, and the man didn't realize this, but he took all, he pulled all her teeth out while the uh, woman was dying. Uh, and uh, the, the, of course, this story was, you know, shocked the sensitive ladies of Richmond at the time, as you can imagine. <laughs> but circulation jumped from 500 to 3,500. Wow. <laughs> so in other words, he realized sensationalism does sell. <laughs> well, can you, uh, what were the circumstances, I mean, what were the circumstances around Poe's death? Uh, there's, I know there's some question there, uh, a little bit of uh, gray area or something. How did, how did, uh, and when, I mean, when was it, that, when did Poe uh, pass away and what do we know about that? Well, in uh, 1849, he went to, um, he went to, uh, to uh, Baltimore, uh, and he was going there to get his wife to bring her back, or I mean, excuse me, to get his mother-in-law, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. to get his mother-in-law to bring her back to, uh, to live with his fiance in Richmond. You know, I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you may have, you know, the, uh, my monologue, I believe I mentioned, you know, that Poe was very happy that, he, right. his, that his life was finally going to, right. you know, mm -hmm. was going the way he but wanted he was, it he to. was engaged at the time. Right, he was engaged. Uh, but uh, he stopped in Baltimore, very mysterious circumstances. We don't know what happened at all. And the bottom line is we just don't know what, uh, what we don't know how he, hi how he died. There are about 50 theories. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the, uh, uh, well, we have time to mention, you know, that the one that I think probably is the, is the best. Sure. Uh, the, um, quickly. Very quickly. Okay. He, uh, when they moved his uh, uh, body from the um, cemetery to another location, the uh, coffin came open and the ske and his, his uh, the skeleton fell out. I mean, this sounds like a post story. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, uh, but uh, the there was a stone rattling around, a solid mass in the skull, and uh, they realized that uh, it was a calcium deposit. Hmm. And so he could have very well okay. had a brain tumor. Could have had bearing on mm -hmm. that. Well, George, I want to thank you again for being with us today. This is George Bartley uh, of Morgantown, and I'm Mark Payne. I want to thank you for joining us for History Alive.